Welcome, everybody. My name is Somini Sangupta. I'm the international climate reporter with The New York Times. I am uh, very pleased to welcome you to this session. The stakes could not be higher. If you've seen a little bit of that slide presentation, uh, you know that uh, the world is uh, at, a, at a crossroads. Um, humanity is at a crossroads. Those are the words of uh, the last United Nations uh, report last September on biodiversity, which reminded us that one million species are at risk of extinction. Not only are we wiping out these species of plants and animals, but the collapse of biodiversity could endanger our own food supply and our own health. The stakes really could not be higher. So I am delighted to uh, welcome you to listen to a panel of experts who are deeply, deeply versed um, on the subject of oceans and biodiversity. We come together on the eve of another major international meeting when the countries of the world will try to figure out um, how to slow down and, and stop this massive collapse of biodiversity. So uh, please let me welcome first the, um, the Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy from the island nation of Barbados, uh, Minister Kirk Humphrey. He will make opening remarks. He will be followed then by uh, our esteemed panel, who you see on the screen now. They include Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, the senator from the beautiful state of Rhode Island in the United States. He is co-chair of the Senate Oceans Caucus, followed by um, Eba Lepage. She is executive vice president and head of corporate sustainability at Lombard ODA. She is joining from Geneva. We have uh, also with us Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, uh, the chief executive officer and chairperson of the Global Environment Facility. Uh, I know Minister Rodriguez uh, from his former role as the uh, Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. And uh, finally on the panel, M. Sinjayan, the chief executive officer for Conservation International, also joining us uh, like Se Senator Whitehouse from uh, Washington, D.C. So welcome, everyone, and I will turn over the mic first to uh, the Honorable Minister from Barbados. Minister Humphrey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies, Ms. Somani Sengupta, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from the U.S. Ocean State of Rhode Island, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a good day to each of you. It is my privilege to address these virtual ocean dialogues on behalf of the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, and all the good people of Barbados. Prime Minister Motley offers a most profound regret at not being able to deliver these remarks herself, but she also offers her fullest support to this conference and these dialogues. I want to begin by applauding the Friends of the Ocean Action and the World Economic Forum for hosting these virtual ocean dialogues. These dialogues keep this topic of maintaining a healthy ocean environment in the front of our minds. It is inextricably linked to the whole sustainable development agenda and for island states like Barbados, it remains on the forefront of our individual agendas. Let me also thank Mr. Claus Swab, the founder of the World Economic Forum for inviting me and the government of Barbados to deliver these opening remarks. I speak to you as a representative of a small island developing states with a perspective on the world as big ocean people. We recognize the ocean for its own intrinsic value. But we also pay homage to the ocean for the role it plays in bringing balance and securing all forms of life. The government and people of Barbados take very seriously the need to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, including marine debris and nutrient pollution, a goal which we have set to ourselves to achieve by 2025, which dovetails with one of the objectives of the sustainable goals, goal number 14. For us, however, this is not just another target to achieve, but rather a necessity, as we acknowledge that a healthy ocean is a wealthy ocean. The sustainable utilization of our ocean wealth is a vehicle to facilitate long-term socioeconomic growth, 
as well as resilience to environmental and other vulnerabilities to which Barbados was and still is at risk. Just by way of a fact, our exclusive economic zone is over 400 times the size of our land space. And therefore, for us, it warrants considerable attention. Setting a target of being fossil fuel free at best or carbon neutral at worst by 2030, we are focusing on our energy and energy renew renewable energy as part of our development program. Recent studies from the Caribbean Development Bank have suggested that our oceans can provide enough energy to power our entire nation and the countries around us. So how do we achieve this? There is a need for continued research and development in hydrokinetic energy, and perhaps this represents an opportunity for Barbados to twin with the great ocean state of Rhode Island to enter into a mutually beneficial relationship. My friends, as Barbados tries to derive benefits from its blue economy, the government has entered into negotiations with the Nature Conservancy for the purposes of establishing a National Conservation Trust Fund, as well as the preparation of a comprehensive marine-based, science-based marine spatial plan. I consistently make the point that we are aware that though the blue economy requires significant investment, it is also an opportunity for us to realize our fullest potential. Like our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean region, we have limited fiscal space, debt buildup, slow implementation capacity, and a lack of blue economy investment. All of these, combined with falling over official development assistance at a time when it is most necessary, compounds the enormous challenge ahead. And it is in that tone that I want this, these dialogues to, to consider what it is that we are actually facing. As we strive to keep our ocean space healthy, we have embarked on a number of policies and strategic actions to assist us in so doing. I wish to elaborate very quickly on a few of them here, as I believe it will offer real insight on the needs of developing countries. Having for the first time in history established a Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy, we partnered with UNDP to conclude a Blue Economy Scoping Study and an initial action plan for Barbados. In addition, we are currently working with the IDB on a strategic roadmap project, which will also lend significant value to Barbados. My ministry is currently working with the FAO and recently completed a new fisheries policy, and we are in the process of improving our fisheries management, management act. The fact that is that relationships will be the cornerstone of how we now build out. And that is why I'm pleased to talk about our sustainable fish value chain project with the FAO, which will make life really beneficial for the fishermen. This project will allow us to remain committed to using sustainable methods as we fish so as to maintain the balance between man and the sea. And herein, I wish to remind you that engaging technologies in fishing and in fisheries must not be the exclusive purview of the developed world. We seek balance in all things. And I also wish to remind this forum that illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing or IUU fishing as it is commonly known, disturbs this balance and it must be halted for all of our sakes. Those of you who can stand, I urge you to stand up and to stand out. My friends, we are also defending a clear path to being zero carbon, to having zero carbon in our shipping. And there's much I can say on that, but I will at another time. Our Brayshawn Port has a vision to be the leading green maritime hub in the world. We will be building out infrastructure to allow us to become that green, innovative and sustainable. And these are practical tools that we will be employing. We have, like many other countries, banned petroleum single-based plastics. And in Barbados, for example, we did so in 2019 to stop the, the spread of plastic pollution in our oceans. But I also must say to this dialogue and to these conferences that it is important for us to also realize that we must stop greenwashing. We cannot cheat and win this war against petroleum-based plastics. So let there be no doubt that Barbados gives its fullest support to the Commonwealth Blue Charter. In 2019, we became a member of the Commonwealth Clean Ocean Alliance. We since then joined about six other critically important action groups. It is our hope as a country to be able to play a more leading role in this Blue Charter given its importance. My friends, if we do not look after the ocean and all we derive from it, then it will not just be the marine flora and fauna that will die, but the lives of our people will also be at stake. Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean have experienced firsthand the fallout from climate neglect in real ways. Every year, between June and November, one of our Caribbean islands is likely to be devastated by a category four or five hurricane. 
Every year, sargasm seaweed, and if you do not know what sargasm seaweed is or looks like, I suggest you Google it so that you could get a sense of the devastation that we are actually facing. But it covers and overwhelms our beaches during some of the most beautiful months in the Caribbean. Every year, more of our popular West Coast beaches are disappearing, and our coral reefs are now a, more shadow, a mere shadow of their former selves. We have it in ourselves to find these solutions to these problems, to adaptation and resilience buildings, to halt and to reverse the effects on the impacts of climate on the lives of our people. So our responses are not about being crafted as small island developing states, no. We see ourselves, as I said, as big ocean developing states. In countries like Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean, our brothers and sisters like Seychelles in the Indian Ocean, Samoa in the Pacific, and indeed all around the world, find ourselves facing a raging climate that we have done little to offend and do everything to appease. Yet we remain on the front line of a battle that sees the ocean with whom we have lived with an unspoken and endearing peace treaty or friendly contract built on respect, now posing a real existential threat to our survival due to climate change. I therefore call on each of us on this call and those who can hear my voice and strongly urge that we send a message to those who do most to hurt our climate, requiring them to do more for those who are being hurt by climate change as a consequence and as a result of their actions. We cannot do this on our own. Let us agree to continue these dialogues well past our COP15 Global Forum, as they provide the space for us to meet and collaborate on what we can do to ensure that we build sustainable oceans and sustainable solutions into how we treat our ocean environment. These are important dialogues, and I offer on behalf of Barbados our fullest support, and I oblige you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having me. Thank you, Minister, for, um, for your remarks. They are uh, a profound reminder that not just Barbados, but all of us, to some degree or another, are big ocean people. We rely on the oceans for food or for work or for play and increasingly for energy. Um, with that, I want to turn to our panelists um, and first of all, encourage those of you who are listening in to contribute to this discussion on ocean and biodiversity by um, sharing your questions with us. And to do that, please take your phone, go to slido.com, use the event code hashtag 815289, or uh, you can scan the QR code with your, with your phone. The QR code should be showing up on your screen uh, and uh, send us questions and we will hopefully have some time at the end of this, uh, uh, at the end of this panel. So welcome back to our, uh, to our panelists. I wanna start with um, just a lightning round. I wanna throw uh, a couple of words at you one by one and tell me what comes up in your mind. Just one word or one phrase when you hear these words. Some of these are borrowed from the minister's remarks. Senator, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, seaweed. Algae. Uh, Carlos, fish farms. Fish farms, moving from being um, uh, hunters and gatherers in the oceans uh, to manage uh, properly the resources. Sanjayan. Oil and gas. Opportunity to change. And Eva Lepage, deep sea mining. Uh, need to think about transition to a more uh, sustainable way. All of these issues are uh, very much part of the discussion on oceans and biodiversity. Um, I want to start with, uh, with Senator Whitehouse. Um, you've been an outspoken critic of illegal and unregulated um, fishing, uh, which the minister from Barbados spoke on. Can you tell us a little bit more about why that is so important from your point of view? And for the rest of us, is it 
possible in the years ahead to eat only wild caught fish from fisheries that are well managed or is it inevitable that we will be eating more and more farmed fish well i think um iuu fishing or pirate fishing as i like to call it because people who aren't into the jargon understand what you're talking about um pirate fishing does a couple of things first of all it undercuts legitimate and managed fisheries um, second of all, it's a really toxic form of human behavior um, that also engages a lot of other problems and affect human slavery. Um, if once you're involved in the illegal fishing trade, it's a very short hop to become involved in other illegal trades, trafficking. So um, it's a scourge that has been able to live in the shadows of the far sea where we have not had coordinated uh, enforcement. And I think it's something that we would do very well to be completely rid of. Um, everything about it is wrong and indecent, um, but we simply haven't had international consensus and resources enough to put it out of business. So I don't know how much the ocean can sustain us uh, off wild caught only. Remember that we're starting with an ocean that has been beaten down to where many pelagic species are 90% knocked down from numbers that have happened in our lifetimes. So uh, can the ocean as it is presently cared for sustain us with wild caught fish? I would doubt it. But the ocean has a wonderful capacity to regenerate, given a chance. Mother Nature uh, tends to take care of herself, and we've done a rotten job of giving her that space. Senator, what would it take to eradicate pirate fishing internationally? Well, you know, we're getting there. The international treaty, uh, the Port States Measures Agreement, has helped make landings more difficult. Um, Private work, like the Vulcan uh, Foundation's work to track boats, um, even with like satellite wake recognition software, or to recognize when a transponder gets shut off. Uh, there are technological advances. We're trying to get the United States military more engaged in this because they have quite good visibility in the seas. Um, they've been reluctant to move, but continuing pressure through our national defense authorization bills uh, is beginning to have an effect on them. And this administration may take the matter more seriously. I think it's a question of starving the markets and driving enforcement on the high seas. I can imagine using the U.S. military to uh, go after uh, pirate fishing could be tr very tricky diplomatically. It could be tricky diplomatically, but when you're on the high seas, it's quite wide open. And what we're looking at is not so much, you know, American destroyers hunting down these boats, but rather uh, the military's surveillance and intelligence resources being deployed to support identification of the pirate vessels so that they can be uh, chased down when they get near port or um, captured uh, out on the open high seas by whoever's nearby. A uh, quick word of, of uh, uh, compliment to uh, Indonesia's fisheries minister, Susi, who uh, sank a lot of pirate fishing boats. Hmm. Um, I want to circle back to something you said about um, uh, nature being given the chance to regenerate. There's been a lot of discussion um, in, the, uh, in the months leading up to the next biodiversity COP about 30 by 30, about setting aside 30% of the world's oceans and land for protection. Um, Sanjayan, I want to turn to you to sort of lay out the context of that. Why are we talking about that now? And why is it important really quickly? Well, I think it's an interesting uh, question. I mean, you know, I've been a little bit puzzled by this myself. You know, it, it's it certainly caught people's imaginations, um, and it's probably a lot of different factors that the world seems tuned to the loss of diversity on the planet. 
And I think we have frayed our ecosystem so badly that I think in every work of life, in every place, in every community, people are starting to see that direct linkage between nature and their own well-being. And I think this last year probably did more of this than ever before. If you ever needed to have a reminder of the importance of nature, all you need to do is essentially look outside. So I think that strengthened our connection back into nature. I think there's a bold goal of 30 by 30. Uh, I think the science is, you know, how much is really needed is a, is a big question. But bottom line is we need a lot more than what is currently protected. When it comes to the oceans, we're protected somewhere between almost 3% to about 7%, depending on how you count protected. But let's say on average, we protect about 5% of the oceans. I think most people on the planet, if you actually ask them, is that enough, would say no. They instinctively know we do need more. Now, the good opportunity we have right now is that we are finding that countries are willing to think about large, large scale ocean conservation. If you go back to when I was in grad school, that was just completely not on the table. And then you had a couple of them being developed, one in the United States, Papahana Umukwakia, but also what we saw in uh, Kiribati and Phoenix Island protected areas. And you started seeing this idea that very large protection of a country's entire EEZ, for example, is really possible. So I think there's been, you know, a pressure and understanding that we need more than what we have, as well as a willingness by small countries often to really think that they're not small countries, they're actually large island nations. And that confluence gives us this opportunity right now, I think an opportunity we will not see in our lifetime to really make a big leap towards doubling, tripling the amount of oceans under conservation management. But it'll only work if we work together. How much of the world's ocean have we altered or extracted for, you know, human needs, whether that's for fishing or mining or or something else? Anyone on the panel have a have a estimate of that? I mean, Senator Whitehouse probably knows it better than I, but I would say virtually all of it has been impacted yeah. by humans. For sure. Yeah. You can go to the I think most all of it, and even where there's time. nominal protection, if we haven't put the resources into actual guardians and sentinels to make sure that the protection is real, then um, the problem remains. Uh, but some Minister, of the good news yeah. is that it mm-hmm. can, in ocean systems, it can come back quickly. So this idea that restoration, ocean systems do have some re- resilience. And you can go to certain places and you can see, in my lifetime, I've seen the massive positive change through protection. Costa Rica, Carlos Manuel, I'm sure can speak about some of those examples. But really, even in, in the United States, Monterey Bay, 100 years ago, it's better today than it was 100 years ago. That's kind of an astonishing thing. Minister um, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, I want to turn to you about the 30 by 30 efforts. What are the prospects um, for this becoming reality? Um, and you know, I, you may be reluctant to read the tea leaves on this, but what will be the um, the sort of diplomatic, you know, nitty gritty of this in the months well, ahead? Th- well, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm I'm very optimistic because uh, this is the first time in my life that I've seen that the gap within the scientific recommendation, the political aspiration is narrowing down and fast. And, and, and these are great news. Um, and uh, I'm very optimistic that, um, you know, the political commitment around 30% uh, will be achieved. So here, two things are important, uh, Sumini. One is that political, the political commitment should be based on concrete goals and targets. And here, the, the 30% is a very important and relevant one. And, and then... We need to work on narrowing down the global financial gap so we can be able to put the resources behind the political actions to achieve uh, all expected uh, targets. And and this is something which is extremely relevant because we need to mobilize um, financial resources from all sources. It's not just... um, you know, international ODA, which is going to narrow the gap, or it's not just the private sector kicking in now big time and uh, contributing. It will be a combination of uh, countries generating more policy coherence. And this is key in the marine realm. Um, Countries, uh, and and I'm talking about developing, developing country, 
uh, has a big issue in terms of policy coherence because they still invest uh, through uh, incentives, policies, and subsidies way more resources and activities that are threatening their marine ecosystem than what they are investing in, protecting, and using it uh, properly. That's one element. We need to uh, help countries um, move uh, the tax burden from taxpayers into uh, to polluters. And, and those are the things that can help us really narrow the financial gap. It's not just mobilizing innovative non-fiscal resources what will help us. It is a combination of a few of them. And uh, Elizabeth Marena and um, the CPD has done a fabulous job working with an expert uh, panel for resource mobilization that has helped, uh, gave us the, the uh, given light on how we should mobilize resources from all sources that will help us at the same time generate more policy coherence. Because in terms of ocean conservation, at the country level, we got a big challenge because we've got a minister of agriculture who oversees the fisher, fishing agency and a minister of environment who doesn't agree on how we should manage uh, the marine and the ocean resources. That's, uh, for me, one of the biggest challenges that we need to confront with. Can I circle back on the resources question? You're saying you're very optimistic that the scientists have managed to persuade political leaders that ocean conservation, at least, the 30 by 30 target, is important, but that resources are required. Can you clarify that resources for what? Are you saying for countries that commit to uh, protecting land and ocean? Yes, that is correct. Uh, uh, we, we have a lot of information on the terrestrial biodiversity part, and uh, we've got some gaps in terms of the global financial needs uh, with respect uh, to, to ocean investment. But very, very simplistically, we, we need to be able to have one marine spatial planning and uh, actions by which uh, we can design a structure for optimum ocean governance. There, there's a big gap on how humans uh, manage the, the land resources and the ocean resources. And as I said in my first uh, question, uh, so many, we humans uh, still behave like, uh, like, we, uh, like we used to behave in the land 15,000 years ago. In the ocean, we're still hunters and gatherers. So we need to generate a kind of a social contract, an understanding on how we manage those ocean resources. If we see the constitutions and the legal frameworks of most nations of the planet, there's a kind of a social agreement on how we manage resources and how we uh, aim for development. Uh, on the ocean, we don't have that. We need to begin generating social understanding that is very well reflected in our constitutions and legal framework. Then we need to put the science. We need to understand what we have there and how we manage that. The marine spatial planning is a key element. And this is what we do at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in the land. We do land use planning. And based on that, we set policies and establish our roles and responsibilities. Then the other elements is ocean governance. The ocean is being governed by those who are not willing to manage it properly. And there's a lot of stakeholders that need to be part of this new structure that we call it ocean governance. And then we need to set the policies to move from this irrational neoclassic economic model into a blue economy. And I'm delighted uh, to be able to share the panel today with the minister, Mr. Humphrey, that is a minister for blue, blue economy. This is the right political decision that we need to see at the country level so we can see a shift from the mindset to the policy action at the country level. So the question of money um, brings me to you, Eba Lepage. Traditionally, money has been invested into, you know, extracting valuable stuff, whether that's oil and gas on the ocean floor or fish or something else. There's lately been a movement to uh, put a value on natural assets. How do you do that? How do you put a dollar figure on a coral reef? If it were only that easy, I think, I think one has to take a step back and first think, how do you ensure that natural capital is relevant to investors? Because when you think about it, I mean, asset managers, wealth managers, pension funds have a fiduciary duty 
to manage clients' funds and get a return. So how do you then explain that natural capital is key in the decisions that an investor takes? One is what has been mentioned, of course, now several times um, today, is the part that natural capital and the oceans obviously play a role in our global econ economic activities. It's, Can I stop uh, you and ask you what you mean by natural capital? Natural capital is all the resources that come out of our earth and our biosphere, basically. So if we now just focus specifically on the oceans, I'm not going to talk about forests and everything else, but of course, oceans are included in the concept of natural capital. Um, and of course, then you explain to, to investors that oceans, for example, or other parts of natural capital have a very important role to play in industries that investors care about, whether it's agriculture, tourism, healthcare, etc. Then some people think, oh, the way we have the way we manage our oceans has an impact on what I want to invest in. And the second is to raise people's awareness of the companies that are finding solutions to the problems that we're seeing today. Such I as? Think those are, such as, for example, the, uh, the uh, destruction of reefs, for example. I mean, as we know, what I've, what I've discovered during these, these years of looking at this is how shellfish function as nat uh, natural filters, for example. A mussel can filter 200 liters per day. You have companies who are looking to, in a sustainable way, develop areas, of course, and, and ways to fit for fish farm, for example, that do not have a negative impact. These are the companies that we need to find and invest in because these are also, they both take care of nature, but also, we believe, have the best returns. And it's, a, it's an interesting path. And I would say the mainstream investor today is not really focused on natural capital, but it's coming. Because as you mentioned, I would say the past year, past two years, it's really the next step in sustainable investments. So from what I'm hearing you say, valuing natural capital is an idea, but it is difficult um, to, to quantify it and to sell investors on the idea that their returns are going to be what, what they have expected. It's difficult to value specifically to say our coral, coral reefs are worth X, for example. That's difficult. So then you need to angle it to say, the company that does X, Y, Z, what are the returns of that company? And look at the good effects that they're having, the positive impact. That's the way one has to do it right yeah. now. So that raises the question, right? Is it, and this is a question for any of you, is it, if we're talking about valuing natural capital, if we're talking about ocean biodiversity, is it consistent to both um, keep investing in oil and gas and B, to be subsidizing um, investments in fossil fuel resources? Well, no. from our side, no. I mean, sorry, I'll just very quickly, Senator, say from our side, it's not. I mean, one has to really transition from fossil fuels to a sustainable economy. There's no question about it. How do you sell your investors on that idea? Have you said to them, we are heretofore not funding any more fossil fuel projects, except for the ones that we're already in? What, what's the bank's position on that at the moment? The way we look at it is that it's really the, you have to support the transition economy, because basically you can look at a fossil fuel company that has no plans for the future. They will continue doing what they're doing. We're not interested. You have those companies that are looking to transition to a sustainable economic model. They're moving towards renewable energy, et cetera. We look at those companies and many of them we support. And then of course we follow up if we see in five years, nothing has changed. Well, then maybe it might not be an investor target anymore, but we have to support the transition. That's, so your, that's your window is five years. You want five to take a look at what they're doing in five years? Well, we follow, of course, every year. But if you have a company, you see no change after five years, you know not much will happen. After one year, it's pretty quick. Ten years is too long, far to look ahead. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, you had an unequivocal answer to that question. Tell me more. Well, the problem for uh, Ms. LePage and others um, is that the fossil fuel industry has a very, very strong record of simply not telling the truth. 
Um, they've run a very systematic uh, scheme to mislead the world about climate change, to say that it's a hoax, to say that the repair of their damage will cause economic suffering. Um, it's been a, probably the biggest information operation uh, ever run. And the idea that they're suddenly going to become honest about the transition goes against all our experience of many decades with how uh, dishonest they have been about climate change. So you really have to watch them like hawks and you've got to hold them to really hard objective standards that are things that are measurable now. Because a promise for 2050 is can be nothing but you know greenwashing noise. So I think you've got to be very, very careful uh, about them. And uh, they have been used to living on an enormous subsidy. The IMF puts the subsidy in the United States alone at $600 billion every single year. So to protect that, they've gotten involved in politics in a very unhealthy and, and uh, degrading way to uh, American politics. I suspect that's true in other countries as well. But it just makes it really hard to solve the problems we're talking about when the, the industry perhaps most responsible for these problems uh, gets to sit on a $600 billion subsidy and everybody has to compete against that position of economic privilege. Do you see any change, any appetite for change on those subsidies in the United States? And I ask because there was some discussion around the G7 uh, talking about that this year at, at, the, at their meetings. Um, so do you see any 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 change in mood yeah. on the question of? Yeah, I mean, there's a strong subsidies. appetite in the Senate on the Democratic side for putting a price on carbon to offset that subsidy, and I think there's a recognition. It's a bit different that it's from taking away the subsidy. Reach our goals if we don't uh, take on that subsidy. You simply can't ask renewable energy to take on an uphill fight against an incumbent that has a six hundred billion dollar annual subsidy and expect the good results to come from that. It's interesting and, uh, that you say, and, please. Yes, uh, Sumi, and, and let me add just a little bit of complexities to this because we are, we got the same kind of challenge, political economic challenge in the food production systems where humans produce our food. Exactly the same thing that we're, you know, the Senator the White House is mentioning to us in terms of the political interest, the, the economic interest, the political challenges to, to, to address you know, perverse incentives and, and subsidies, and how do we do a transition trusting the sector? I, 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 I strongly believe that uh, one big issue in terms of going forward is really understanding how do we um, balance the economic playing field so all actors will be, uh, will be reacting to that effort. And, and up to today, you know, all those negative externalities uh, from the energy sector, the food production systems are not fully reflected, not in their own balance sheet or even the national accounting systems. And here's where we will be asking the Minister of Finance to fully internalize that. You know, the Minister of Finance will not last um, a week uh, if he tries to do that alone without really understanding ourselves the whole um, political approach that we needed. Uh, so. Congress and parliaments in all countries are key in, in these elements, and the challenges associated to those processes are very complex, as, as uh, Senator uh, Whitehouse has mentioned. But uh, that is uh, a very important approach. We need to move uh, towards a, an economic system that fully uh, internalizes those negative externalities and rewards for the positive externalities. This is what happened in my country, in Costa Rica. We were able to revert deforestation and double the size of the forest in the same period that the economy tripled because we phased out perverse incentives in forest conservation and land use and went from perverse into positive ones. We put a tax on fossil fuels. With that revenue, we did a payment to owners of forests for their services that they are providing us in terms of carbon and water. So we went from, you know, not reflecting a, a negative externality all the way to reflect a positive one. And people will react to that. I will, I will say that you know, the, the quickest way to get to the heart of the person is to the pocket. And that has worked in many pocket. ways. Oh, yes, through the pocket. No doubt about that. that. Yes, you can educate them, values and principles, but the quickest way to get to the heart of the person right. is through the pocket. It's very, uh, it's very interesting. The way 
uh, the road to biodiversity and climate change, the road to addressing biodiversity and climate change really does uh, to a large degree come down to money and, uh, and subsidies and where those are, are, are channeled from what you all are, are saying. I want to turn really um, quickly now to questions coming in um, and a reminder to our audience, please do um, send us questions uh, on ocean and biodiversity. The first one from Sally Sudworth of Mont McDonald, she's asking, do we understand what percentage of species is vulnerable to acidification due to climate change? And what is the subsequent impact uh, expected to be on the food chain? So any of you can take this on if you wanna talk about climate change and its impact on food security. So well, Diane, you, you have some experience in this, yeah. Sure, I mean, the, the simple answer is the in the oceans, virtually the entire food web, so virtually every species in the ocean is very vulnerable to this issue, uh, both of temperature rise, but also of acidification, because ocean acidification makes it hard for the smallest organisms in the ocean to survive. And that trickle-up effect really impacts everything, all the way up to, you know, a blue whale. The, the last time, you know, the planet, to, you know, if you go back to sort of, um, you know, a deep history and you look back at times when the atmosphere was had a lot more carbon dioxide in it and you look at what marine life looked like in the oceans, you find that, say, 95 percent or more of species in the ocean died off during these very, very large extinction effect events, 95 plus uh, percent of species died out in the oceans. So if we don't get a handle on climate change, if we don't meet our Paris climate targets, et cetera, it is going to become increasingly difficult ultimately to maintain it, the life that you see in the oceans and then the trickle effect of 300 million plus people, uh, actually billions of people ultimately who are dependent upon it. Senator, I, I can imagine you are hearing about the impacts of climate change on fisheries uh, in the United States. I, I wonder if you can address this question of how a warming ocean could impact the food supply chain. Well, there's a general flight poleward of species. And um, in regulated fisheries, the regulated fisheries are very slow to catch up to that move. So you end up with very peculiar anomalies. And in less regulated fisheries, you end up with, um, you know, artisanal fishing, people who have developed uh, a particular uh, set of species that they uh, fish for, and um, that's gone. And in fact, you're starting to see sort of a vacancy belt in the warmest uh, equatorial waters where the poleward shift is not being replaced by poleward shift from further south because there's nothing you know from further towards the equator because there's nothing there's nothing there so we have a uh, belt developing that um is going to be hard to figure out how how fisheries sustain there so we're seeing a lot of these problems and of course um you're seeing the acidification problem hit the shellfish and the shellfish industry considerably and um you know the humble pteropod Nobody thinks much about the humble pteropod, but studies nearly a decade ago showed more than 50% of the pteropods in the American Pacific coast with uh, severe shell damage, hmm. which relates to the acidification. And when the pteropod falls out of the food chain, a great number of species fall with it. And I think, you know, the salmon fishery is looking at that with real concern. With real concern, absolutely. And, uh, uh, so me, let, please. Um, let me just add um, uh, uh, one more element here, which is the fact that uh, the scientific community a few years ago, like three, four years ago, told us that um, in the IPBS report that uh, if we humans uh, continue business as usual, we will uh, lose around one million species by 2030. Unfortunately, that report was done before DNA bar barcoding technology was being used. Uh, meaning that uh, we don't know 
the the amount of the species that we have uh, in the planet. We probably have ten times more species than one we freely really thought. So we're mm. not going to lose uh, one million species. We're pro- most probably going to lose uh, ten million species, and many of them are known to science. So uh, we are underestimating the, the impact that uh, we will uh, generate in the biological diversity of the planet. I mean, one thing to keep in mind, Senator, when you were talking about the poleward shift, this, of course, uh, means not only uh, an impact on what people can eat, their sources of protein, but also on how they make a living. There are a lot of people around the world who make their living from uh, from from fishing. Yes, um, in, in, in uh, sorry, I was going to say in in, Pacific, in in Western Pacific, there are fourteen countries heavily dependent on tuna. It's basically powers the entire nation in terms of the economies. That tuna has shifted dramatically in the last decade, and we're working with those countries and others to basically figure out where they've gone who's now having more tuna than in the past and how better to share that resource. It's a very dynamic system right now. And countries that have hadn't had these sorts of catches are seeing it, whereas other countries that are entirely relied on tuna are finding that they're absent in their waters. I'm sure you all get this question, um, and I think it's a really useful one. As a citizen, uh, what are the ways to protect the ocean uh, more effectively? (laughs) <laughs> quick ones solve climate change vote <laughs> i mean vote. you know look you know pick the company you you support and and vote i mean to look at look at the washington post today and the article about exxon mobile and you know basically stakeholders saying you know we got to do this differently if people aren't willing to participate in the electoral process if they're not willing to make their voices heard you know, they're watching their own demise at their own time. And and it can really matter. I really believe company CEOs today, it, it, more than ever I've seen in my lifetime, are actually serious about this issue of, of conservation, of sustainability, of biodiversity. It is on their radar now. We used to be kept outside the WEF ba- barriers, you know, a decade ago. Then we were let in. Now we're right in there. But we can't do this alone. So you've got to make your voice heard with companies. You've got to make your vote count. Let me just say from the United States Senate that that CEO interest in these issues has not penetrated, has not penetrated at all through the political infrastructure that corporate America has erected to give direction to Congress. And one of the ways in which I think these corporations have to be held accountable is to be held accountable for their political lobbying. Because if you think there's a necessary role for government, then it's important that CEOs say one thing and their political apparatus does the exact opposite because their political apparatus is still completely in denial, completely in obstruction, or completely absent without leave. There's an interesting question that's come up that I wonder if um, Eva Lepage can take on. You, um, you, it's been mentioned that to an extent, uh, there's still um, uh, some unsettled science about um, the, the, the link between finance and its impact on biodiversity. Can you talk a little bit about that, the link between finance and its impact on biodiversity? Uh, your, uh, your organization uh, has, a, has a partnership with Oxford University to kind of get at this. Could you, could you speak to that briefly? Sure, yeah, I think here that the, the point was really important is that the investors and the financial industry can have a huge, huge impact on climate change and the direction we're taking just on how we allocate capital. So that's that's the first thing really to think about. And but when you our decisions and our investment decisions must be science-based. We firmly believe in that. And this is why, for example, we last year we entered into a partnership with, as you mentioned, the University of Oxford. And this is a partnership that fosters research and teaching on sustainable finance and investment. And we focus on climate change, circular economy and nature. And it's both a platform for knowledge exchange between academia and financial services. But we also want sustainable finance to be a field of research so that it becomes ingrained and in part of academia. And we, for example, I mean, just one example of the way we work in this partnership is that we're working with with our partners at Oxford 
on, uh, for example, business model alignment to a nature positive economy where they are teaching us how to use geospatial analysis, for example. That's just one example. So it's important, the partnerships, and it's important that we don't work in silos between the financial industry and academia, because there's a huge, huge benefit of working together. We've talked a lot about um, climate change and its impact on ocean biodiversity. Um, the United States is back in the Paris Climate Accord after uh, a brief absence. Uh, President Biden has staked out uh, a fairly ambitious set of targets. To carry these out, he needs, to a large degree, support from um, the Congress. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, what are the prospects uh, for, you know, getting your colleagues um, in both houses, um, in both parties, to... Uh, to, to come around to this. And if there is no political consensus, what should the rest of the world make of the U.S. promise, or really the U.S. promise on anything? Well, we're going to have to make that political consensus happen. Um, I think the Biden uh, administration has shown uh, a good opening posture in personnel and policy and in passion on climate. We have not seen that before from any administration. So that's a good step forward. We'll see what the House of Representatives chooses to do, but it's controlled by Speaker Pelosi and they don't have a filibuster. So she's very strongly positioned to get a significant bill done. And we in the Senate, I think, have uh, a substantial Democratic contingent that intends to be a firewall to see to it that when we get to the climate aspects of the legislating that needs to be done, we are targeting the 1.5 degrees threshold that is Mother Nature's goal for us. And anything less is a failure. Doesn't matter how many people are happy. If you haven't met that goal, you have not succeeded. So we're gonna work very hard to make sure that's the case. We have all the tools necessary to make this happen. It's just a question of um, you know, the determination to get it done and the parliamentary space to do it. Right now, we're on a, I would say, bipartisanship detour to see what can be accomplished from a bipartisan perspective. Obviously, you're not going to get much done on climate from a bipartisan, I should say, say that differently. You're not going to get the big stuff that we need to get done, done from a bipartisan perspective while the fossil fuel industry has such control over the Republican Party. Um, so at some point, we're going to have to do this as Democrats, and we, have a, we, we are keenly aware we have a very narrow window in which there's a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. And if you lose any one of those three, the chances for uh, real progress here diminish drastically. Speaking of getting the job done, it is my honor now to um, uh, introduce to you a woman who needs to get the job done in a very short window of time. She is Elizabeth Maruma Marema, Executive Secretary for the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. It is her job to uh, rally the nations of the world who belong to the Convention on Biodiversity. The U.S. is not one of them, uh, incidentally. It is her job to uh, get an agreement done. So I'd like to say goodbye and, and a huge note of gratitude to all of you on the, on the panel, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, Minister Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, Eba Lepage, and uh, M. Sinjayan. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation. And please, everyone, uh, welcome Elizabeth Morema to the floor. Thank you so many. You are really giving me a hard time, but uh, well worth it. Uh, allow me first to join you to thank not just the World Economic Forum for initiating this dialogue, but to all the panelists, the minister, I mean, all of whom have underlined how important the ocean is, not just for species which are out there, but the key species is us, human beings. And this human being, unfortunately, his and her actions on the ocean are depleting that ocean to the extent that the minister also underlined how, how negative impacts 
uh, this polluted ocean with choked with plastics. And uh, the senator has uh, also talked of IUU illegal unreported fisheries. How all these will get the islanders even more uh, difficult to live. So I think from all the panels, one clear message which I got out of it is that ocean is life. And without it, there is no life. Likewise, for this forum, if we are saying now it's run up to our conference of the parties 15, without the ocean community, that community which is looking at sustainable ocean management away from unsustainable incentives. And we know fisheries has been one of those areas uh, with unsustainable incentives in terms of subsidies. We need to get some of these funds, if not all, really redirected into sustainable ocean management. Uh, Carlos has talked of, yes, resources, and we have posed questions to him, but we should also remember, which he also underlined, resources, we are not asking for new resources. Resources are already in place. What we are asking is redirecting existing resources into sustainable marine biodiversity. That will already save a lot of the marine biodiversity and the ocean, which is being depleted. Examples were given of incentives like positive taxes, so that also the fishing industry sees the benefit of sustainable fishing for the, not just for their own business, but their own individual life as human beings. So a lot has been said uh, in this, in this, uh, uh, panel discussions, and as I said, without ocean, there's no life. You are asking me, how do I get the ocean community uh, to the conference of the parties 15? Clearly, the panelists have answered that. If the community is not with us, together, not as individual, concerted, integrated, mainstreamed uh, ocean management into all sectors of the economy, then of course COP15 will be a failure. And if COP15 is a failure, clearly then it means we, the human beings of the current century, we have failed and will have failed even for our children and those of the future generation. Because there will be no, there will be no ocean to leave behind. We leave them with a toxic ocean, which then they cannot survive without it. So despite the historic nature, even of the ongoing pandemic, clearly we've seized this opportunity to make a historic uh, moments for nature and the ocean. And we've also seen here, uh, I think Carlos talked of ocean governance, the confluence of major developments across global institutional framework for the ocean has bestowed on us a once in a lifetime fortunes to change our cause of ocean and the life they are in. And the minister underlined that, the senator underlined that, even the panelists, and especially uh, uh, who talked of the natural capital and the impacts on that. We are all aware that the last three decades or three decades have virtually lapsed since the adoption of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which together with the Desertification Convention or the climate change, which also is the subject here. But then since then, while we agree progress has been made, clearly that progress, much as it has led to uh, expansion of uh, uh, marine protected areas in line with our each biodiversity targets, uh, has also increased the mainstreaming of biodiversity into sectorial management, responding to sustainable development goal 14. But we still know a lot needs to be done the ocean is still being choked with, uh, with uh, debris, with pollution, with plastics. And no single country can deal 
with these matters alone, knowing very well that the ocean is a transboundary matter. So all of us need to be there together in terms of taking action. So continued biodiversity loss, runaway climate change, all presents all the fundamental risks to our health and stability of the ecosystems that sustains all of our societies. And the COVID has clearly shown us that we need to reimagine and transform our relationship with nature while promoting this global uh, community uh, of working together in this health. As you may know, we are in the process of developing our post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be adopted at the next conference of the parties. And this will be the primary fundamental one will say, or uh, others have even acquitted to it as a Paris for biodiversity, that we really uh, expect it to be adopted. And it also builds upon everybody's common goal, not just for nature, but all the services that nature provides and underpin for a healthy, productive, and well-functioning society. And this framework will include goals, targets, policy directions, which will include also the ocean to guide our global society for the next three decades and beyond. We recently launched our Global Biodiversity Outlook, which had also looked at where do we go from here as far as transitions for nature is concerned. And among the recommendations specifically include transition for fisheries, oceans, climate change, sustainable food systems, and all in biodiversity inclusive One Health approach. So food systems uh, uh, panelists have also talked about that. And the report also underlined all these transitions they cannot be achieved if they are, we expect them to be achieved in isolation from each other. The ocean cannot be placed in a silo. It underpins all of the transitions and all together are needed to achieve this healthy uh, planet which we are looking forward. We have been celebrating this week International Biodiversity Day with a theme uh, we are part of the solution. So for today, I take it that we all as the ocean community, together we are part of this solution to ensure that we have a future for our children uh, and a life for our children and our grandchildren, which will have that clean ocean. Barbados already have enacted a legislation to ban plastics. Many more have not yet. We know oceans, oceans continue to be choked. Are we emulating those best practices so that together we reach coming for the conference of the parties 15 with that vigor, that ready to take action and will not take action from October, but actions have already begun, continue and will continue to be enhanced and threatened and uh, strengthened moving forward. So let me stop there, Sumini, equally thanking everybody for all these lively discussions, which clearly gives me more hope as we run up to the 15th Conference of the Parties. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing that's clear, there's a big to-do list. So I'm going to let you all go uh, so you can get to work. My big thanks <laughs> to all of you. Um, and we will keep, uh, uh, I look forward to more discussions on ocean and biodiversity and climate change as we um, head to the big meetings in the fall. Thank you all. And thank you to our audience for joining. <laughs>